Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Olgun Akbulut. I'm a human rights and constitutional scholar based here in Istanbul. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar on COVID-19 and refugees. This event is organized by Human Rights Academy or the Frederick Norman Foundation Turkey. On behalf of the Academy, I would like to issue a warm welcome to all of you. Today, we are holding the third webinar of the Academy's webinar series on COVID-related human rights issues. Uh, our topic is refugees in the context of COVID-19. The COVID-19 crisis had devastating effects on vulnerable groups such as asylum seekers and refugees. Some states sealed their borders and denied entrance. Uh, some other states suspended asylum procedures and some other countries also deported asylum seekers without any hearing. And these measures were implemented only on the basis of national public emergency laws, which means once again, international legal obligations, such as the principle of non-refoulement have been disregarded. Likewise, since the beginning of 2020, the world has even witnessed extinguishment of right to seek asylum. And refugees on the other hand, also took their share from the emergency measures. In some areas, uh, they are simply forgotten in camps. Uh, they have problems to access healthcare facilities, and in some other states, they are not listed in the vaccination programs. So to address these issues, uh, I'm going to stop here and invite our speaker, Dr. Uh, Nick Tan. Hello, Nick. Uh, welcome. Nicholas uh, is a human rights scholar currently working at the Danish Center for Human Rights. His academic works focus on refugee law and human rights law as it relates to asylum seekers and refugees. He has taken part in a number of projects in these fields. Uh, I will suggest all of you to visit humanrights.dk uh, on the web. Uh, that's the uh, website of the Danish Center for Human Rights. There you will find outputs of Nicola's scholarship and lots of information about the ongoing research projects at the center on COVID-related issues. And a short note about the program today, uh, Nicholas will have around 40 minutes to present her initial thoughts. Then we'll look forward to continuing the discussion with the members of the audience. We are planning to complete the full program in one and a half hours. Now, over to you, Nick. Thank you so much, Professor. It's really a great pleasure to be here. And thank you to the Frederick Neumann Foundation for the chance to present to uh, such a distinguished group of students and colleagues. Um, as the professor mentioned, I'm a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for Human Rights, uh, which is Denmark's national human rights institution, with a mandate to promote and protect human rights in Denmark and abroad. Um, as you can also hear, I uh, am not Danish. Uh, I'm, I'm originally Australian. So please do let me know if my Australian accent is causing you problems uh, and I can try to translate for you. As well as my role at the Institute, I'm also the convener of the University of London's uh, uh, core legal module on, in, on its master's program on forced migration and refugee protection. And what I'm going to present to you today is a short article uh, forthcoming in the International Journal of Refugee Law that I've written with a colleague, Daniel Geselbush, whose book, Refuge Lost, I can very much uh, recommend to you all. And what we've tried to do in the first months of the pandemic was focus on state responses in the face of asylum seekers in those first, uh, frankly, uh, rushed and uh, very difficult months of the pandemic in the first half of 2020. We focused on access to asylum in Australia, Europe and North America. And I can absolutely rec uh, recognise that this is a fairly narrow set of countries. And of course, as we go, I'll widen up the discussion to see how asylum may look after the pandemic, not just in these states, but more broadly. So in my initial address today, I'm going to essentially try to outline for you five elements that we've observed uh, in the first year of the pandemic. First, I'm gonna set the scene by explaining uh, the right to seek asylum as a matter of international law. Uh, 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 as, as the professor outlined, I am first and foremost a lawyer. So while we are concerned with policy and protection here, I will anchor my discussion in international refugee law and human rights law. Uh, 
Secondly, I'll describe something to you, which uh, in my previous work with Thomas Gamelsoft Hansen, I've, we've called the deterrence paradigm. And this is something that predates the pandemic, but is in fact concerned with how developed states have increasingly sought to control, deter, and externalize their asylum obligations. And thirdly, I'll turn to the impact of the pandemic on the right to seek asylum as well as briefly mentioning the impact of COVID-19 on resettlement of refugees globally. Um, and finally, I'll make some reflections on what asylum might look like in a post-pandemic world, where we're going uh, in terms of seeking asylum and protection once the pandemic is over. So if I could begin then with some fundamentals of the right to seek asylum as a matter of international law. And here, I, of course, I should acknowledge that there are some colleagues in the audience who are themselves expert in this area. But I just want to frame our discussion uh, before getting into the empirics. So as we know, the term asylum lacks a legal definition and the institution of asylum is not a straightforward area of international law. The Norwegian professor Gail Masson had this classic conception of asylum as comprising three separate faces. Firstly, asylum as a state prerogative, uh, that is the right of a state to give protection to any foreigner that they wish to. Secondly, the right to seek asylum, to cross an international border and make a claim for protection. And thirdly, the right to enjoy asylum or asylum as a solution for those found in need of international protection. And what I'd suggest to you is that um, these uh, three faces of asylum hold true today. Um, but let me try and hone in on the second of these faces of asylum. So as we know, Article 14 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights sets out an individual right to seek and enjoy protection from persecution. However, the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees or Refugee Convention is in fact entirely silent on access to asylum. And there is this normative gap uh, within international law uh, as to whether a person can in fact cross an international border and apply for asylum. Instead, of course, the 1951 convention lays down the principle of non refoulement which the professor mentioned in his introduction. And this uh, cardinal, most fundamental of principles prohibits the return of a refugee or indeed an asylum seeker by any manner whatsoever to a risk of persecution. The principle since 1951 has been embedded in international and regional human rights law instruments, and now prohibits the return of not just refugees, but any person to a real risk of torture, inhuman degrading treatment or punishment. But I think you can see the normative gap here when we talk about a right to seek asylum, that's an individual right. When we talk about the principle of non refoulement that is a right not to be returned. So there is a normative and physical gap uh, in which people can move across borders, or at least a gray area of international law that has yet to be uh, uh, definitively answered. So what Daniel and I and our work are interested in is the individual right to apply for protection. And what we would suggest is that there is, that this right does exist as a matter of international law, uh, it, it stems both from the Universal Declaration, but also as a corollary to the principle of non refoulement. And what we're really interested in here is a sort of a procedural right for an individual to come to a border or cross a state border and claim international protection from state authorities. The state is then uh, obliged to offer a fair and a effective asylum procedure, assessing the truthfulness of that person's claim. Now, there is a live question in international law as to whether this right to seek asylum is, in fact, a right of entry into a state. Most refugee law scholars would say that to effectively uh, meet this obligation, states need to temporarily allow asylum seekers to access the territory. Um, uh, James Hathaway, for example, a leading refugee law scholar, has said that this is a de facto duty of admission. Um, we don't go so far. We, we believe that, in fact, um, uh, 
uh, non-government or right to seek asylum obligations can be answered at the border or even extraterritorially. But clearly the obligation means that states must conduct an individual fair and efficient procedure to determine the needs of an asylum seeker. And this is what, this procedural right to seek asylum is what we looked at uh, with respect to the pandemic. Now, before we move to the events of 2020, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on what, um, what I've called the deterrence paradigm here. And this is to show you that the right to seek asylum has been under immense pressure in the global north since the end of the Cold War and not uh, simply in the past year. So what I'll give you here is a very brief overview of so-called deterrence or non entree practices that target the different modes of travel um, for asylum seekers wishing to access the global north, Australia, Europe, Canada, and the United States. And as I've mentioned, these practices have evolved essentially in the past 30 years. So what we see is what um, some scholars have called the sort of the shifting border. We see enforcement measures that block asylum seekers by traveling by plane, by sea, and by land. And these uh, control mechanisms occur in countries of origin, countries of transit, and of course, at the borders of destination states themselves. So across the entire mobility continuum. These include visa screening, airport check-in uh, checks, points of embarkation, transit points, international airports and sea points. And what we see is that along uh, all these points of travel, states have developed a suite of policies to uh, block or control the movement of asylum seekers. In addition to that, if an asylum seeker does happen to reach a state's territory, um, there are another set of measures that uh, facilitate the removal of those asylum seekers who in fact managed to circumvent those controls. So what I want to outline for you is firstly, when we think of seeking asylum by plane, a combination of more or less invisible visa controls and carrier sanctions have proved very effective in preventing asylum seekers from using air travel. And as a result, it's now impossible for most citizens of refugee producing countries to simply board a plane to the states of the global north with no visa. So states don't uh, generally issue visas for the purposes of seeking asylum, uh, and they tend to employ uh, quite elaborate risk factor algorithms to deny potential asylum seekers access to temporary visa categories. So what this means in practice is that if you happen to come from states like Eritrea, Afghanistan, uh, South Sudan, uh, or Myanmar, then it's very unlikely you'll be able to gain a visa to access states from the global north. In terms of the enforcement of these visa restrictions, uh, it's not states themselves who carry out such checks, but rather the airline companies who are tasked with ensuring that individuals without a valid visa are presented for, prevented from traveling. And these are implemented by, by so-called carrier sanctions, which means that uh, civil aviation companies are, are, paid, are paying fines or levies uh, when uh, passengers do board without valid visas. Uh, in addition, states employ so-called airline liaison officers in both transit and departure states to assist and advise these private companies to enforce, enforce their visa enforcement responsibilities. And as a result, these, this combination of visas, uh, carrier sanctions, and document, documentation checks have made it near impossible for refugees to travel by air. Um, what this means then is that over the past 30 years, we've seen the emergence of far more dangerous modes of irregular travel over land and sea. And now I'm gonna move on to consider this crossing of land borders. So what we've seen is that states have erected border walls. This is a very obvious and uh, clear uh, mode of migration control. Um, prominent examples include the uh, US-Mexico border, we have uh, Norway's Arctic border with Russia, Hungary's border with Serbia, the Bulgaria-Turkey border wall, and of course the reinforced Spanish enclaves in Morocco. And what we see here is border enforcement shifting outwards, away from state borders, uh, with refugee transit and source countries 
being used as, as essentially buffer zones. So if we move away from crossing land borders, we then of course come to crossing borders by sea. And here we have a particular focus on the policies of Australia and the United States, which have long-standing policies of interception and returning asylum seekers at sea. And these uh, somewhat unfortunately have been upheld by the superior courts in both jurisdictions. So in both the US and Australia, asylum seekers are transferred summarily without an assessment of their claims to extraterritorial asylum processing sites. The United States has operated migrant operations centers on Guantanamo Bay in Cuba for this purpose since the 1990s, which provided a blueprint for Australia's offshore processing of asylum seekers in Nauru and Papua New Guinea that you would be familiar with. <clears throat> and in both countries, these policies have been effective in, in fact, deflecting and deterring asylum, all, almost all asylum seekers arriving by sea. In Europe, the European Convention on Human Rights and the EU Asylum Acquis provide perhaps the most robust protections of the right to seek asylum in the developed world. However, even before COVID-19, access to asylum has been subject to a range of migration control measures. A deterrence has been particularly marked since the migrant refugee crisis of 2015, sparked in part by the flight of Syrian asylum seekers, of course, transiting through Turkey. And this is perhaps most particularly evident in the central Mediterranean, where both EU and Italian cooperation with the Libyan government includes funding, equipping and training the Libyan Coast Guard and a reprisal of Italian-Libyan bilateral agreements to, to combat irregular migration. So while in 2015 and 2016, uh, departures from Libya were perhaps the most prominent uh, source of asylum seekers to Europe, now we see that route being very much closed off via control uh, and cooperation with the EU. Following the European Court of Human Rights decision in the uh, well-known hearsay judgment, uh, which prohibited Italy's interdiction and return of asylum seekers to Libya, we see Italian actors have attempted to circumvent their non formal obligations by avoiding direct contact with asylum seekers, instead coordinating search and rescue with the Libyan Coast Guard, uh, an approach, by the way, which is currently the subject of the SS case before the European Court of Human Rights. In the Eastern Mediterranean, we've seen Spain strengthen bilateral cooperation with both Morocco and Tunisia, as well as hot return by both land and sea. So finally, if I could um, paint a picture of this so-called deterrence paradigm before the pandemic, um, I'd like to mention safe third country arrangements. And this is where asylum seekers do manage to arrive on state territory. They manage to avoid all the controls as outlined above, but yet may be denied the right to seek asylum in that country. So the safe third country concept was developed in Europe in the 1980s and has subsequently spread to many countries across the global north. And the policy essentially allows for the return of asylum seekers to a particular country on the basis that they can access effective protection in that country. So as you would know, the Dublin regulation in the EU assigns responsibility for asylum seeker protection to the state of entry. And as a result, coastal states at the EU southern border, notably Greece, Italy, and Spain, as well as Malta, and uh, Eastern European states uh, at the EU's land borders like, like Hungary, and have attracted significant groups of asylum seekers and have it become key migration control sites, especially since 2015. And of course, the EU-Turkey statement of March 2016 allows for asylum seekers arriving in the Greek Aegean islands to be returned to Turkey on the basis of the safe third country concept. This has led to a significant fall in irregular migration between Turkey and Greece, but there have been serious concerns raised as to the welfare and safety of returning. In North America, the safe third country concept exists through the Canadian US third safe third country agreement, which continues to be relied upon by Canada to, re Canada to return asylum seekers to the US. And most recently, we saw the use of the so-called migrant protection protocols under which the United States returned asylum seekers to Mexico, awaiting the conclusion of their asylum proceedings. In some cases, and perhaps most troublingly, we see asylum seekers being sent to destinations with which they have no pre-existing relationship. 
So Australia's offshore policy is one example under which asylum seekers who have passed through India, Indonesia or Malaysia are then transferred to Nauru and Papua New Guinea. As I mentioned before, Australia's uh, approach is based on the US uh, Guantanamo approach from the 90s, but in fact seems to have inspired the new US, Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador uh, agreements, whereby asylum seekers to the US have been transferred to those three states uh, for processing. And finally, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, my own state of Denmark is currently, uh, as we speak, has a developing legislation to make such third country transfers possible to an as, as yet unnamed third country. Again, the key point here is that there is no requirement that the asylum seeker has previously been in that country or has a connection to the country to which they're being transferred. So if we are to sum up at this point, uh, the, the key message is that the right to seek asylum stood on very shaky ground well before COVID-19. Uh, before the year of 2020, a combination of visa regimes, carrier sanctions, maritime interdiction, extraterritorial asylum, and safe third country rules made access to asylum in the global north difficult and dangerous. And then, of course, the pandemic arrived. So I want to turn now to look briefly at the impact of COVID-19 on seeking asylum. And um, perhaps my key point uh, for you is that we can essentially see two phases. The first is the sort of immediate initial responses. And the second is the, the, the gradual return to normalcy and the reinstatement of asylum. So I'll come back to those. But let's start from February and March last year and, and move through the first uh, period of, of the pandemic with respect to seeking asylum. So what we argue in our, in our paper is that essentially the COVID-19 pandemic initially at least brought the deterrence measures that I've outlined above to their logical conclusion. So border closures and states of emergency in destination states essentially suspended the right to seek asylum for, for the initial few months. If we take Australia as an example, uh, it's now impossible to seek asylum in Australia. So while the sea route has been shut off for some time, since about 2012-13, well before the pandemic, some asylum seekers had been able to fly to Australia on valid visas, mostly student visas or employment visas, and then subsequently apply for protection. Under COVID-19 travel restrictions, uh, no asylum seekers can enter Australia unless they're an Australian citizen or permanent resident. And this is on the basis of a declared human biosecurity emergency, which activated expansive powers under the Biosecurity Act of 2015. Shortly thereafter, the Prime Minister of Australia announced that uh, the country would be closing its borders to all non-citizens from March of 2020. Exemptions can be issued by uh, the Border Force Commissioner where there are compassionate or compelling rounds to, uh, reasons to travel to Australia, but um, the, the, the need to seek protection is not one of those grounds uh, for an exception. Um, if we look then at the United States, um, I don't know how much you can see, but that image says, uh, Australia is closing its borders to all non-citizens and non-residents from 19th of March, 2020. And that is the, that's the current situation today as well. The US has gone down a similar path, announcing travel restrictions on the 20th of March, 2020, um, that allow, or did, did allow, I should say, in the past tense, border agents to deny entry to almost all asylum seekers. So the orders were issued by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, and they authorized the immediate deportation of undocumented aliens arriving overland from both Mexico and Canada. The legal basis for the order is the Public Health Service Act, which authorizes the suspension of entry of persons to the US, where there's a serious danger of the introduction of a communicable disease. The only very narrow exception for asylum seekers is when you could make a claim under the Convention Against Torture and where the person made a 
affirmative, spontaneous, and believable claim of a fear of torture. So as, as won't be a surprise, uh, virtually no asylum seekers uh, were assessed to meet this threshold. Um, by the end of July of 2020, 105,000 individuals had been returned to Mexico under these rapid expulsion procedures. And according to the Washington Post, just two asylum seekers of about 20,000 who entered by the southern border were allowed to remain between the 20th of March and the 13th of May 2020. So a very tiny minority. Even Canada, a state that has uh, in general respected the uh, protection obligations has been turning back asylum seekers uh, since 14th of March, 2020. And Canada has continued to rely on the safe third country agreement with the United States, notwithstanding the potential risks of chain level more that I've just outlined. In the US, um, uh, sorry, in the EU, the pandemic uh, precip precipitated external and internal border closures, the initial suspension of asylum procedures and further restrictions in the Mediterranean. So as a result, as you can see from this image here, uh, asylum applications to the EU dropped to just 8,730 in April and 10,200 in May, down from 34,000 in March and 61,000 in February. So a really significant drop in the first initial two months of the pandemic. You can see also that sprung back uh, somewhat, but overall in 2020, uh, asylum applications were down by about 30% in the EU as a whole compared to 2019. By June of 2020, asylum applications had increased to 31,500, but still remained well below pre-pandemic levels. Now, the EU picture is far more mixed uh, than both the Australian and the US. The, uh, the EU Commission has been, I think, very uh, fairly promising and protective towards asylum seekers. Uh, it, for example, recommended that border closures, in fact, include exemptions and exceptions for asylum seekers. And even throughout the pandemic, most states have, in fact, continued to admit asylum seekers, including Austria, Denmark and Sweden. However, the right to seek asylum was suspended or curtailed in certain uh, European countries. In Hungary, for example, a state of emergency declared in relation to the pandemic has suspended the right to seek asylum effectively. Also for asylum seekers who reached European territory, the suspension of asylum procedures was uh, delayed, um, oh, sorry, has delayed access to, uh, to asylum procedures. Uh, Greece, uh, as you would know, suspended its procedure for one month for asylum seekers crossing via the Turkish land border. Uh, and most other European states closed their asylum offices, effectively suspending the procedure. Um, some countries, uh, more promisingly, halted in-person interviews but kept channels open for applications in writing or indeed some remote uh, interview processes were introduced. So there's a mixed picture in the EU. However, um, on the Mediterranean, uh, we saw um, the use of the pandemic, I would say, to justify more extreme measures. Uh, so Italy, Malta and Cyprus closed their ports for most boats, citing public health concerns, preventing the disembarkation of asylum seekers rescued at sea. Malta began using private vessels to detain asylum seekers at sea or indeed return them to Libya. To Libya. Um, Greece, uh, as you can see here, has uh, used lifeboats to conduct pushback operations to Turkey. Uh, and the United Kingdom is considering a pushback policy in the English Channel. So our overall uh, conclusion, I think, is that the right to seek asylum in the, those first initial months of the pandemic, pandemic suffered rather badly in the global north. In Australia, we saw the closure of routes to protection by air alongside existing rejection of asylum seekers by boat, effectively extinguishing the right to seek asylum in that country. Similarly, the Trump administration's use of sweeping public health order has effectively ended territorial asylum in the United States, but it's gradually being reversed by the Biden administration. And finally, the picture has been rather more mixed in Europe. While some European states upheld the right to seek asylum by exempting asylum seekers from general border closures, other countries used the crisis to suspend the right to seek asylum. At the external border, 
some states pushed back and refused port to asylum seekers by sea. I just want to touch briefly on, it, on another element of asylum here. I know I promised that I would be rather focused on seeking asylum, but this is a, a graph of global refugee resettlement uh, in, in the years 2003 to 20. And what we saw is that, um, and, and of course I should say that resettlement is one of the three durable solutions. It's operated by UNHCR under its mandate. Resettlement is the transfer of a refugee from a first country of asylum for the permanent protection in another country who has agreed to admit them. Um, and what we can see is that while the number of uh, refugees resettled hovered at around 70 to 80,000, uh, for the decade of the 2010s. In 2020, that number was substantially reduced to just 22,000. And a significant uh, criticism of resettlement, of course, is that um, it's essentially a discretionary policy choice. There's no legal obligation involved in resettlement. And this, I think, seems to bear that out. So what can be said then about the first months and perhaps even the first full year of the right to seek asylum under COVID-19? First, on the more worrying side, we see a real danger that some measures introduced on a temporarily or a um, emergency basis may in fact harden into permanence. And we've seen this in other areas of asylum policy. For example, Schengen border controls introduced during Europe's 2015 crisis, in some cases, remain in place today. Second, we saw signs that uh, certain states were exploiting the state of emergency during the pandemic to effectively limit access to asylum. And the United States uh, public health order is perhaps the most egregious example of a state essentially exploiting or using the pandemic to cover for policy priorities that were previously unfeasible before COVID-19. I should also note that we've seen some, um, some sort of bounce back for the right to seek asylum. We have certainly seen a gradual lifting of border closures. We have seen uh, asylum procedures that were initially suspended being reopened uh, and functioning again. Uh, we have also seen the use of some um, technology-driven asylum procedures using remote technology. And these are really positive uh, signs for the survival of seeking asylum beyond the pandemic. And this is just a snapshot of where we are right now. This is uh, from UNHCR's uh, dashboard uh, on border, uh, border closures. We see that um, 32 countries have no COVID-related restrictions, 81 countries have restrictions in place with, relate, with respect to their borders, but apply these uh, really excellent exceptions for asylum seekers. And yet there are 61 countries where access is still denied, uh, including for asylum seekers. Uh, so, so there's a fair bit of work to be done. So let's look at how we consider um, the right to seek asylum can be protected uh, in, the, in a post-pandemic world. Uh, what we expect is that, uh, as I've mentioned, some emergency measures will be, soft, will be softened and, and, and uh, procedures will return to normal, but we also expect that some will remain in place uh, even when the pandemic is somehow behind us. So um, most immediately, of course, we have this potential for strategic litigation in the global north. Uh, there may be scope to challenge the legality of some of these restrictions introduced, for example, on public health emergency grounds in domestic courts. Uh, some measures may have never been valid in the first place. Other uh, restrictions, while may be valid when issued, may cease to be so when the public health emergency is contained. Um, and, and we think here that strategic litigation in both domestic and regional courts has an important role to play. Uh, there, there needs to be a focus on ways to hold governments accountable for their, for their actions in this regard. Uh, and there needs to be arguments under both human rights and refugee law that a state's jurisdiction flows from situations where it exercises effective control. We also think it's important to look beyond existing human rights and refugee law 
There's been some success in this area with respect to tort law, for example, with respect to financial auditing law, uh, and holding governments accountable for their actions against refugees. But we, of course, recognise that strategic litigation alone will not be enough. At the heart of this crisis of seeking asylum is, of course, a crisis of solidarity. Uh, we argue that states have adopted essentially a competitive mindset, implementing more and more restrictive measures to shift asylum flows to other jurisdictions. And in turn, states feel pressured to copy or even go beyond existing restrictions uh, to avoid the prospect of increased asylum flows. And we know that a similar mindset will make states reluctant to be first movers when it comes to easing COVID-19 uh, restrictions. As a result, coordination between states on how and when to lift restrictions could help these concerns and would be looking to the EU and UNHCR to assist in such coordination, which they're already doing, by the way. There is, of course, uh, questions about broader commitment to solidarity and responsibility sharing to counter this long-standing uh, pushback against the institution of asylum. And here we'd be looking to the Global Compact on Refugees uh, and the focus on resettlement and complementary pathways, which I'll return to. Um, <clears throat> but of course, what we really need here is state leadership, political leadership. Um, and there are some really excellent examples of good practice here. Uh, Germany, Sweden, to some extent Canada have been leading the way. Um, of course, we know that 85% uh, of refugees in fact live in the developing world. Uh, and there have been brilliant examples of leadership from states like uh, Colombia, Uganda, to some extent Turkey, with respect to hosting very, very significant numbers of asylum seekers and refugees. Um, just for example, Colombia uh, just last week regularised the protection of 1.6 million Venezuelan refugees and migrants. So if I could sum up for us um, to look at <clears throat> the asylum system after the pandemic, I actually wanted to end uh, by drawing your attention to three instruments um, that I think are particularly relevant here. The first, of course, is the Refugee Convention itself, uh, which turned 70 this year. And as the convention turned 70, we will be asking ourselves, of course, whether it remains fit for purpose. And there remains a real risk that states will be turning away from the convention as it's simply too outdated and to uh, design for a time that is, is well behind us. My own argument, of course, is that the fundamental principles of the convention remain as relevant today as they did in 1951. And <clears throat> I can echo the sentiment of Volker Turk uh, in saying that the Refugee Convention is, I think, the human rights instrument that has saved, literally saved the most lives by providing asylum refuge and protection uh, for so many millions of refugees over the past 70 years. So we should not abandon it lightly. The second and far more recent instrument is of course the Global Compact on Refugees. And you may be familiar with this uh, instrument. It's a, it's a non-binding soft law instrument, uh, uh, essentially designed to achieve more equitable responsibility sharing for refugees across the world's nations. It was passed by UN General Assembly re resolution in December of 2018. Um, and while soft law is firmly rooted in the 51 Convention and 97 Protocol, the compact, I, I think, unfortunately, at, at present at least, is a victim of timing. Um, it takes a whole of society approach to refugee protection. It tries to marry up development and refugee protection and encourage private uh, investment in refugees. Unfortunately, the pandemic has really hampered the rollout and implementation of the GCR. And there is, of course, a risk here that um, this brand new uh, global instrument sort of essentially never gets off the ground uh, because of the pandemic. So we must hope and uh, work that um, despite the pandemic, uh, the GCR can gather some momentum and make a real difference. 
And finally, at the more regional level, uh, sitting here as I am in Copenhagen, uh, in September of 2020, the EU released a new pact on migration and asylum. Um, now, to my mind, there is little truly new in the pact, uh, but, but there are a few observations I'd like to make in closing. The first is that the pact really places uh, European asylum at the external borders. The European borders will become the key site for control, both of access to territory and also for quick returns from the territory. So we're going to see a sort of standardization of the hotspot approach at many EU borders. It also introduced a crisis regulation to deal with mass influx situations, increasing EU preparedness for situations like 2015. And while the solidarity mechanisms remain voluntary and flexible, mandatory solidarity does kick in in times of crisis. A further element of the pact is its focus on resettlement and complementary pathways. So what I expect to see is a quite a significant in, up, uptick, in fact, an increase in resettlement numbers to the EU, as well as a suite of complementary measures. So uh, education pathways for refugees, employment pathways for refugees, uh, family reunification, and um, private sponsorship for refugees. I expect to see uh, pilots being started in all those areas. And finally, of course, there will be intense cooperation with third countries, including Turkey, uh, which we can discuss in the Q&A. So in closing, these three instruments, to my mind, will be key to how the right to seek asylum emerges from the pandemic. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, before moving on to questions, uh, I would like to remind to the members of the audience that we not only take questions, but if you would like to contribute to the discussion with your own comments, views, observations, you are welcome to post them on the Q&A or chat uh, function down there on the Zoom. Now about the questions, we have a bunch of questions about uh, the vaccine. Uh, it's about, uh, do refugees have access to anti COVID vaccines. And uh, second question about the vaccine is, do you think vaccinating only citizens and legal residents violate undocumented immigrants' right to life? So first, access to vaccine, anti-COVID vaccine for uh, refugees, and then not vaccinating them, whether it would violate right to life of undocumented uh, immigrants. Shall we start from there? Thanks, Professor. Yeah, they're, they're wonderful questions, and I'm sorry I didn't get to the vaccine question. I should uh, I should have been clearer that uh, our contribution uh, is, was written late last year, so at a time when vaccinations were just a dream. Um, look, <clears throat> the truth is I'm not, I'm not an expert in, uh, in sort of refugee vaccination, public health, but of course there is a... Um, there, there are, I think, two uh, intersecting dilemmas here or, or, or potential problems. The first is that access to the vac vaccine in general in the developing world is gonna be a major issue. Uh, it's very clear, I think, that the global North states are buying up the vaccine. They're over, uh, <laughs> over providing for their population. Uh, so there is a real question as to whether not only refugees, but also poorer parts of the world in general will have access to the vaccine in the short term. The second element or, or challenge is of course, well, um, if you have refugees on your territory, to what extent should they have the right to the vaccine? Um, uh, as a matter of international human rights law, um, to my mind, it will be difficult to make a clear claim for a right to vaccination unless you're in a life-threatening situation. And this is where the right to life question comes in. So uh, as much as I would love to sit here as a refugee law scholar and, and argue for the right to a vaccine for all refugees, I, I don't see a binding obligation uh, necessarily in play. Of course, there are very good policy arguments for the vaccination of all residents of, of nation states uh, to control the uh, no doubt future outbreaks we will have. Um, but I don't see a binding international or, or, or refugee law argument there. With respect to the second question about a right to life, 
Yeah, you could. It, it would, of course, depend on the on the facts of the case. Um, if you had a, a a situation where a refugee or a group of refugees were in a particularly vulnerable group, facing particularly life threatening uh, conditions, and were actively and discriminatorily denied access to a vaccine, then you could make claims under human rights law, both with respect to the right to life, but also with respect to non-discrimination, mm -hmm. uh, to my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll leave it there. Uh, thank okay. you for two very relevant questions. Okay. Uh, the other question is about uh, access to healthcare for refugee women and children. Uh, has it been possible during COVID, it says? Thank you. Um, look, this is a very broad question. Uh, I mean, the, the short answer, of course, is that it's very much dependent on the national responses of, of the specific states in mind. Many, many, many states uh, have uh, host refugees, host refugee women and children. Um, there are some, I think, very good examples of good practice here. I remember early in the early months of the pandemic, Portugal opened access to health for all residents irrespective of the status. So that includes both refugees, but also undocumented migrants, asylum seekers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I can't speak much to the situation in the global South, but of course, uh, if you are living in a state which already has uh, highly stretched uh, uh, health um, infrastructure, and you are yourself undocumented or in the process of gaining documentation, uh, there, there would be very significant um, access to health issues. Mm -hmm. One maybe further thing I could say is that um, in general, the refugee pol uh, population at a, at a very general level tends to be fairly young. Um, uh, there are a significant number of refugees who are in fact children. Uh, and in this sense, that demographic is perhaps helpful uh, in the sense that the most serious health impacts uh, of the pandemic have of course been for older individuals. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there is one question about the United Nations response to suspension of the right to seek asylum. Uh, what kind of, I mean, which UN machinery responded to that in which way it says? That's a great question. Um, of course, the UN response has not been uh, coordinated. Um, I think what we've seen in the past uh, sort of 20 to 30 years is uh, an increase in individual special rapporteurs taking an interest in this question. So just for example, just last week, the uh, special rapporteur on the rights of migrants is uh, conducting an in investigation into pushback specifically. Um, we've seen previous special rapporteurs on uh, the rights of migrants, um, but also uh, in relation to, for example, private military and security companies uh, uh, conduct investigations into offshore processing and extraterritorial detention sites. And then maybe more interestingly, or perhaps more impactfully, we've seen the UN treaty bodies be very involved in a vast array of non reformal cases. Um, so if you look, for example, at the jurisprudence of the Committee Against Torture, Currently, about 80% of all claims relate to asylum seekers or refugees subject to return. Um, so that's a very interesting development in my mind because you have these generalized human rights bodies uh, sitting at the UN level, uh, but they are very much being used by a rather specific group of individuals, that is uh, displaced persons or people um, uh, fearing return. Um, well, we have a very long question, but uh, to sum it up, uh, I will say is, is asking uh, the document about the global compact uh, mm -hmm. and it asks whether, in your view, it could be enforceable by the United Nations in the field of refugees uh, as a supplementary instrument uh, to already existing legal documents. Great. Um... Thank you for the question. If I could just also return to the last question, I mean, of course, I uh, I should have touched on the role of the UNHCR uh, in upholding the convention. Um, and then of course, I'll answer the global compact question. Um, uh, UNHCR, I think is in a difficult position 
uh, with respect to the suspension of the right to seek asylum. And the reason for that is the UNHCR is a UN body comprised of and funded by UN member states. So when you have powerful uh, UN member states themselves breaching or at least circumventing their international obligations to asylum seekers and refugees, of course, UNHCR, I think, would like to be vocal and critical, uh, but they have uh, financial and strategic interests at play as well. So what we've seen, I think, is UNHCR be critical when they can of, uh, you know, for example, things like uh, uh, summary returns from the US, but of course, also acknowledging that they have little room to move uh, politically uh, with respect to powerful actors such as the EU and the US. And now if I could return to this question of the global compact, it's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, from a legal perspective, the global compact is perhaps uh, clearly a soft law document. And in that sense, very unlikely in my mind to emerge as a source of authoritative binding legal obligations. And of course, it was never really designed to be that way. I think uh, in the negotiation period some years ago, uh, people like me would have hoped that it would uh, emerge as a sort of a con convention too, um, but, but that was clearly off the table. Um, now, UNHCR's been, UNHCR were very much involved in the uh, negotiation of global compact. They, of course, been criticized for the sort of uh, perhaps the weakness of the compact. I'm rather sympathetic to UNHCR. I think if uh, the, the world states uh, came together and said, we're not interested in a new treaty, UNHCR cannot force governments to undertake a binding agreement they, they will never agree to. So what we've seen is definitely a soft instrument. Um, I think it has uh, quite a lot of potential, but I, as I mentioned in my address, it really has been severely interrupted by the uh, pandemic. What we saw uh, in December of 2019 was a global refugee forum, which some of you would be aware of, whereby states and other actors made hundreds and hundreds, I think about 800 pledges in all, on all sorts of aspects of refugee protection and support. Now, these, of course, are voluntary pledges. Um, they're not binding. Uh, there is a, a standing meeting in December of this year to follow up on those pledges. I would suggest to you that a large number of those pledges will not have been fulfilled and the pandemic will be the primary reason for that. In some cases, that will be entirely valid and, and completely true. In other cases, you can imagine there might be governments uh, once more using the pandemic as, a, as an excuse or a justification. So um, the Global Compact is essentially a framework to try and achieve better protections for the 25 million refugees we have globally and we will just have to wait and see whether it can deliver on that promise. Okay, we, um, thank you. Uh, we have another question about this uh, Greek-Turkish deal. You shortly touched upon that during your presentation. Uh, it's asked Greek-Turkish or in fact EU-Turkey refugee deal. And there are two questions about it. First one is, is that deal legal under international law and international human rights law? And secondly, is that deal ethical? <laughs> That's an excellent question. So let me give a bit of background to the EU-Turkey statement, <clears throat> and then we can talk a little bit about its legality and ethics. Um, the EU-Turkey statement was, is, is a political statement. Uh, it was released in the form of a press release, press release in March 2016 by the heads of government of the EU, uh, the, the EU individual member states, and of course, Turkey. Um, it, it contains a series of, of agreements uh, that go both ways between the EU and Turkey uh, regime. I guess the, the, maybe the primary point of the agreement is that for all Syrian asylum seekers who reach the Greek Aegean islands, mm -hmm. they are subject to return to Turkey. And they are subject to return to Turkey because uh, the EU considers Turkey a safe third country, which is a concept I touched on. Now, um, aside from that uh, sort of return mechanism, there's also a lot of other elements of this statement that, that often are not discussed. One is that Turkey will uh, conduct migration control to prevent asylum seekers leaving 
uh, Bodrum, uh, et cetera, this, uh, the Turkish coast. Um, and uh, the other, of course, is that uh, the EU will fund and has funded, I think, 6 billion euros in support to the Turkish government. And uh, the money that has been employed uh, is, is very interesting, I think. Um, it covers a whole range of both protection and development and migration control areas. So you see EU funding for uh, uh, you know, uh, refugee Syrian uh, students in Turkey. Uh, I think we can all support that uh, for cash payments to refugees in Turkey. We see funding for local communities, not just refugees, but also Turkish communities who are hosting refugees, are building schools, uh, establishing uh, emergency services, etc. Again, uh, we can support that. And then we see funding to what might be called migration management or migration control or indeed deterrence efforts. So uh, funding the Turkish Coast Guard, equipping the Turkish Coast Guard, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this um, funding mechanism has been extremely important uh, in the statement and has a sort of mixed character, at least in my mind, between protection and deterrence. So that's the background. Uh, the, the, other, the other element of the deal, of course, of the statement is that um, the EU has agreed to re conduct resettlement from Turkey. So the idea was that for every Syrian return to Turkey, the EU would resettle a Syrian already in Turkey. Uh, and what we've seen actually is that very, very few asylum seekers have actually been returned. It's only about 3,000 from memory, while about 25,000 Syrians have been resettled ultimately. Um, but still very low numbers in terms of uh, how many refugees Turkey is hosting, 3.6 Syrians, uh, 3.6 million Syrians, as you know. So to get to your question of legality and ethics, on the legality side, um, the safe third country concept doesn't appear in international human rights or refugee law, but in general, it's agreed that the state must have signed the refugee convention and in fact respects the articles within that convention. As you would know, Turkey has signed the refugee convention, but it maintains a geographical limitation, which means that it only recognizes convention refugees from Europe. What this means is that Syrians arriving in Turkey, as many of you would know, cannot have access to the full set of convention rights. And instead, in, Turkey, in 2013, Turkey introduced the temporary protection regulation, essentially for Syrian refugees. And this means that Syrians do receive a level of protection. I would consider it a sort of thin protection in the sense that it's not the full set of convention rights, um, but it does provide for access to the labor market, access to healthcare, access to education. Um, um, so there is a real legal question uh, which I'm probably not prepared to answer uh, as to its legality. What we've seen is that the Greek asylum committees, so uh, the Greek uh, decision makers when reviewing these claims, have been reluctant to return people to Turkey where they have essentially no relationship to the country. So we've seen a couple of cases where a person who transits Turkey for you know, 10 days or two weeks have not been uh, returned to Turkey. Um, and I think that makes good sense. Uh, the, the key question in my mind is, will that person in fact receive protection uh, in the country or is it sort of a shifting of responsibility uh, to, to another jurisdiction? And finally, as to the ethics part of your question, you're asking, is the EU-Turkey statement ethical? Um, I'm not an ethicist, so I can't give you an expert answer, but I think in refugee law terms, what we're looking for is responsibility sharing. Mm -hmm. We want to see that uh, uh, as well as respecting the spirit, the, sorry, as well as respecting the letter of refugee and human rights law, the EU also respects the spirit of refugee and human rights law. And what this means to my mind is that there should be a fairer distribution of refugees in the region. Um, I think it's actually quite remarkable that Turkey is hosting so many millions of Syrian refugees, whereas the EU bloc is only hosting about 1 million across the 27 member states. So I would, I would answer that question in terms of a, seeking a fairer sharing of responsibility between states for the refugees we have. Okay, thank you so much. Um, there are a couple of questions about the European Convention on Human Rights and 
the refugee law, the first one reads as the following. It's a question about uh, judgment uh, decided by the European Court of Human Rights like a year ago. Uh, and the question asks, and I quote, uh, do you think the European Court of Human Rights stepped back from its previous case law in the case of ND and NT versus Spain by not protecting the principle of non refoulement in that case? And I can have a little request from you. I mean, if you could give a little bit background of the case before your response for the members of the audience, that would be much better, I guess, yeah. Thank you, it's a great question. So this case concerned two uh, irregular migrants who were seeking to access the Spanish enclave of Melilla, which yeah. is of course on Moroccan territory, but is Spanish uh, owned, Spanish jurisdiction. And as you would probably know, these uh, sort of enclave cities are extremely uh, fenced off. They're very, very difficult to access. And what you see is irregular migrants and when I say regular migrants, I mean both asylum seekers and and and, and people uh, seeking economic opportunity or, or who don't have a protection need, um, uh, in in, ra in rather large groups try to scale these fences often at night and access the territory of Spain and therefore claim protection or at least remain in Spanish territory. So this case concerned two uh, West African men who who scaled these walls had some contacts with uh, Spanish um, civil guards, but rather than being accepted in Spanish territory, they were so-called subject to so-called hot return. So immediately returned to the hands of Moroccan uh, authorities. Uh, and this is all of course taking place on either side of, of a very, very high uh, wire fence. And um, as it turned out, this was not uh, really a case about asylum. It was a case about collective expulsion. Uh, so Article 4 of Protocol 4 to the European Court, uh, Convention on Human Rights says no European, ca European state can collectively expel a group of people. That is simply return a group without assessing who they are and what sort of needs they would have. Um, <clears throat> and of course, this case went up against Spain. And the two claim, the two men claimed they had been subject to collective expulsion without an assessment of their claim. And the court, uh, and, and I should also say, there's not a lot of case law on this collective expulsion mm. rule. It's a fairly new area of, well, it's been in the books for a long time, but it's a very new, new area of European human rights law. The Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights, um, I think the question used the term stood Took, took a step back. And I think I would agree with that. They took a fairly restrictive approach. Mm -hmm. um, they said, there's no violation here. Uh, they essentially carved out an exception to the prohibition against collective expulsion by saying, in this particular case, we had a group of men storming a secure uh, enclave, uh, trying to access Spanish territory by force, uh, and of course, illegally, and and this is crucial, they also could have gone to a nearby border port, uh, border post and applied for a visa to Spain. So they're basically saying, look, if you're going to use unlawful means and you're going to use force, then the pr prohibition against collective expulsion doesn't protect you. Um, so, and then your question is about, well, you know, is, this, is the court sort of being politically sensitive mm -hmm. or stepping back on human rights? There are, I think, two ways you can interpret it. One is to say, yes, this is the court stepping back, saying we understand uh, you know, irregular migration is the hot topic in, in Europe. We don't want to be seen to be out of step politically or um, misreading the political sentiment. Uh, or the other interpretation to say, well, this case was such a special case with a group of people sort of forcefully trying to access European territory that the actual exception or the carve out the court has made is, is really very small. Uh, and in other cases, the court might return to a more principled or human rights protective stance. Okay, thank you. And uh, there's a similar question about this one, in fact. Um, I'm not sure whether you are aware of the fact that last year Turkey opened uh, the Greek border for refugees to enter. Yeah, you know that. Uh, and the question is about. Uh, the human rights obligations of both Turkey and Greece in that case, because the refugees clashed with the uh, Greek security forces on the borderline. 
It's a good question. Um, so I think that, and there would be people in this seminar who are far more expert on, on, on Turkish law than I am, but maybe if I could say a couple of things about the fundamental obligations here. Um, the, the Greek uh, argument in this case was that the Greek asylum system was so overwhelmed um, that it, the, the Greek government uh, suspended asylum, the right to asylum for one month, as you would remember. Now, the question is, well, is that legal under human rights and refugee law? Actually, if you look at the Refugee Convention, there is no mass influx exception. Uh, as the convention stands, it seems as if, um, irrespective of how many come or in, in what fashion they arrive, the principle of non-refoulement is absolute uh, in Article 33. Now, of course, if you have a situation where a person is a security threat to the nation itself, or commits a very serious crime, you know, a war crime or a crime against humanity, then they have no right to be protected by the convention. But the Refugee Convention, as I've said, does not allow for the suspension of asylum procedures mm -hmm. uh, in the way that the Greek government did so. Of course, you could argue that when there is a threat to a nation itself, uh, that uh, emergency powers do allow for the suspension of both you know, domestic uh, rule of law, but also international obligations. And then of course we have to consider, well, you know, I mean, was this situation at the Turkish Greek border really so serious that the Greek government had no choice whatsoever but to suspend asylum procedures? Um, yeah, I think uh, to be honest, uh, my own legal opinion on this matter is that there, there should be a mechanism to deal with these mass, mass influx situations. It is a gap in the convention. Um, and I would, I'm actually fairly sympathetic to governments who are genuinely struggling with really significant numbers. Uh, and of course, not just uh, sort of humanitarian issues, but also, as you've mentioned in the question, uh, the potential security threats. So I would see this as, as a gap in existing refugee law. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have two questions about um, European Convention on Human Rights and a general question about uh, vaccination passports. Uh, about the European Convention, uh, the question uh, asks uh, whether you think that the Council of Europe should consider an additional protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights uh, about the human rights of refugees. Thank you. Was there another question about the Convention? Yeah, uh, and the other one is, should European Council of Human Rights recognize the right to fair trial for asylum processes in order to bar contracting states to execute fast and arbitrary asylum process uh, due to COVID? Excellent question. Thank you very much. So to move first to the additional protocol question, um, uh, I guess this is a question about how idealistic or pragmatic one is uh, at the present moment. I'm, I'm certainly more on the pessimistic, pragmatic side. Okay. So of course I can sit here and say, yes, uh, the Council of Europe should uh, <laughs> implement and consider and, and, uh, and address, address a, um, a protocol on refugee rights. But I don't are, think that's... We are also very pessimist at this side of the world, you know, about ongoing situation <laughs> or human rights in the world. So it's okay. <laughs> I, I don't think that's going to happen. I, I can't see uh, that being politically on the table. I mean, I think in a way it goes back to this discussion about NT and, and NT versus Spain, right? I mean, uh, uh, that case itself may be an exceptional case, but I think if you look at the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights in the past four, five, six years, there's clearly a uh, restrictive turn for mm. migrant and asylum seeker and refugee rights. Uh, I'm not saying the court is sort of breaching or undermining the convention at all. I just think the court is extremely politically sensitive of its role and its reputation. And I can say, uh, speaking very frankly to you from, from Denmark, a highly skeptical state about the Strasbourg court, there are real, there have been real discussions uh, from certain political parties about simply withdrawing from the convention, about returning to the core of the convention, which is sort of this opposite of a, of a dynamic uh, interpretation. So um, I think the court is extremely politically aware. I don't think the court will um, sort of 
refuse uh, to recognize violations or will, um, will outright go back on its jurisprudence, but I think it will strategically avoid uh, being seen to dynamically develop asylum and refugee rights uh, in, the, in the next few years, at least. Um, with respect to the fair trial question, this is a really interesting question. And, and the background, of course, is that Article 6 of the Convention provides for a right to a fair trial. It only applies to um, criminal matters. Uh, asylum procedures are a civil matter. So that means that um, asylum seekers and refugees in general don't benefit from Article 6 uh, in their uh, protection claims. I, again, maybe as with my last answer, I don't see the development of Article 6 uh, applying to asylum procedures, but I do see the increasing use of Article 13. Mm -hmm. um, I think there will be, as we see, as I mentioned in the PAC, this move towards you know, speedy asylum decisions, uh, quick returns, uh, increased screening processes. Um, I think the use of Article 13 and the testing of um, decisions through a second instance, through an appeal uh, mechanism, will become increasingly at issue. And, and, I, and I'm certain that Article 13 will be more and more relied upon in this context. Okay, thank you. By the way, is it still a hot issue in Denmark uh, about this subsidiarity principle discussion around the European Court of Human Rights, let's say? We know this uh, Denmark Taylor Declaration from 2018 <laughs> about the new role of the court. <laughs> uh, some years ago, you know, fairly recently, there were political parties outright calling for Denmark to withdraw. That's no longer the case. I think there's um, more interest in seeing the court return to, you know, the core principles or, or as, as you've mentioned, subsidiarity principles. Um, uh, allowing Danish courts to be the primary decision makers in, in these very contentious uh, migration related uh, areas. We've also seen very recently some um, favorable decisions for the Danish government. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, criminals uh, subject to Article 8 returns, uh, you know, very serious career criminals who've been uh, ejected from Denmark coming to the European court and having their, their claims, I think, rightfully rejected. So uh, we can hope maybe that, uh, at least in Denmark, the more restrictive turn will uh, bolster support the, for the court in coming years. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, we have a couple of more questions, but maybe I should uh, only ask one of them. Uh, it's a general question. It's not about only refugees. It's about the vaccination passports in general. And the question is about its legality and, again, whether it's ethical or not. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful question. Um, I, my own opinion, and it is just my own opinion, is that probably the legal principle of non-discrimination will become very important here. Um, there is no doubt we're going to see vaccine passports. Uh, some states are already rolling them out. I don't think it's a question of if they're going to come, but rather the extent to which they're going to be used in public life. Um, and my view is that um, vaccine passports are going to be very useful for sort of optional social and entertainment gatherings, uh, you know, flying, flying uh, civilly uh, with, on a plane or going to a football game. Uh, the problem we may run into is when more core civil activities are reliant on a vaccine passport. So for example, if there was a situation where to get a job mm -hmm. in the public administration, you needed a, a, a vaccine passport or to use a public service like a municipality or a library, then we would be running into rather deep and serious questions of discrimination and, and the ability for people to live freely in a, in a, in, a, in a vaccinated world. So um, there is no sort of right or wrong answer, but I'll be looking for the extent to which vaccine passports are used and what sort of activities people uh, who, who don't have them are missing out on. Okay. Well, I think we need to stop in here. Otherwise it may, uh, we can go another 
hour and so on. Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you for this fruitful conversation. Thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, and I would like to thank also for the people uh, working behind the scene, uh, the FNA program officer, uh, Elif Güney Menderes, and our assistants, Batikan and Matthias, working behind the scene. Thank you so much. And thank you, our translators, Karel and Serai. And thank you, the audience, uh, for being with us this evening. And our next webinar will be on 14th of April on the topic of COVID-19 and women. So we hope to see the members of the audience again in April. And until next event, I would say stay safe and help others stay safe. Uh, do you have anything else to add, uh, Nick? Thank you very much for having me. I could just maybe note that I can see some questions in the chat that were unanswered. You're very welcome to write me a mail and I'd be happy okay. to continue our conversation. Okay, fine with us. Then have a good evening. Thank you. Bye.